So before I get started, I just wanted to give you some, let's say some ground rules on how we operate in our Crypto Wednesday. So uh, although we have many, many, many people around the world viewing and they're all excited to ask questions, we do stimulate you ask questions, but please put them in the chat box. So our moderator, Luke, can take care of the questions and we can address the best questions around for today's show towards our uh, special guest. And in the meantime, keep your microphone muted, keep your video uh, muted, so we have the best streaming as, as possible. And before I hand over to my co-host, Gordon, I just want to take also the advantage, or take some time to thank our sponsor, Iconic, uh, because it's all being powered by Iconic, so thank yes. you for that, and thank you for Luke for being the moderator. And before we get started, let's yeah. hand over to my partner in crime. This is Gordon Einstein. He's the founder and owner of Crypto Law Partners. Hey, Gordon, nice seeing you again. Where in the world are you this week, my friend? Uh, this week, I'm still in Los Angeles, but you know, in a couple of weeks, I won't be. I'll be in Dubrovnik because I, I need to escape from LA, to, if, you, if you know that Kurt Russell movie. Um, but it is 5.30 in the, a, in the a.m. here. The dawn is coming up over the hills, but you know, honestly, enough about me. We have an amazing guest this time. I'm very happy to have, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll say his name. I'm very happy to have Brock Pierce join us, a U.S. presidential candidate for 2020, this is just a breakthrough show, and uh, RCP's and interest in this broadcast have been just through the roof. So, Sandra, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Let's let's just launch and make good use yeah. of the time. Cool. F f thanks, Gordon, for the for the quick intro, and uh, I, I fully agree. We are very happy, and we are very grateful for Brock to join our show. Brock has been an easy friend for a lot of people. Uh, in the blockchain and crypto scene, but as most of you know, Brock is now running also for, for president. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the industry. We're going to talk about running for president. We're going to talk, talk about life in general. So there's a lot of stuff. Uh, I think we can get started. And maybe I kick off, uh, Gordon, if you're okay with that, with the first question. Sure. Because during our pre-interview yesterday, and we appreciate, Brock, you also taking some time yesterday. So thank you for that. Uh, we are very curious on... Um, you know, who is Brock? What is it all we're doing? And my main question that I asked you yesterday is why, Brock, are you running for president? What is the main driver? What is your main motivation to run for president? Maybe we kick off with that because that's the most hot subject we have for now. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a very good place to start. And so thank you for having me on. It's uh 8.30 in the morning where I am. I'm on the East Coast. I'm on a train from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. And so uh, uh, running for president is a uh, more than a full-time job. I'm, I'm also uh, joined by my, my running mate, Carla Ballard's here on the train with me, and, uh, and Brittany Kaiser, who some of you know, uh, who's our campaign manager. If you haven't seen it, make sure to check out her movie, the Great Hack. It's on Netflix, The Great Hack. This is how they uh, put Donald Trump in office through Facebook. Um, anyway, great story. So why run for president? Well, I'm a father of two young girls. I don't know what you see, but I'm deeply, deeply concerned about our collective future. I look around and I feel we are not on a good path. Mm -hmm. I feel here in the United States, I feel like this is a nation divided. You know, the polarization between the left and the right is such and so divisive that people are not even willing to engage in discourse conversation. People won't even sit at the same table. This us versus them mentality has gotten to a point where, yeah, people aren't even willing to engage in a dialogue. Mm -hmm. I think that we face multiple existential threats to the future of our nation and quite possibly even the future of our species. And if ever there was a moment in time where we need to stand up for what we believe in, if ever there was a moment in time to rise up, to speak our truth, you know, this feels like that time. It feels like the 11th hour. 
this feels like our defining moment. This feels like the time to act. Mm -hmm. And so I am doing my part to get involved and I'm going to do everything I can to help create a brighter future, a future when our kids grow up, they won't just be surviving, they'll be thriving and know that we've left behind a world for the generations that follow. So that's why I'm running. I love it. And it, yeah. let me ask you something that occurred to me last night, which is what was the moment you decided to run? Like so, what, what, um, what went bang? Uh, I mean, there's a, a, a few pieces to it. I mean, this has kind of been one of those like um, divine callings in my life, you know, throughout my life. But for the first, you know, call it 35 plus years, I would look at the government and I would be like, why would I ever want to do anything working with that? You know, I chose to, to live an entrepreneurial life. You know, I'm not limited by the status quo. I'm not limited by the world as it exists today. You know, as an entrepreneur, a dreamer, an innovator, I don't look at the world as it is. I look at the world for what it can be, right? I have vision and see things that don't exist and then take those ideas and, and do my best to make them into, you know, reality to change the, the status quo. And so I felt I could be more effective in serving the world as an innovator without the bureaucracy, without the red tape. About five years ago, I, I started looking at kind of my life and looking at what we're doing as an industry, you know, building systems of governance, creating, you know, systems of inclusivity, trying to deliver ubiquitous, you know, sort of financial inclusion, for example bringing transparency to opaque markets. I'm just kind of looking at what we're doing here. And these, these things that we're doing kind of look like the, the fundamental building blocks of what might usher in a new era, a new age uh, 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 for humanity. And so I started looking at my life going, okay, I guess this could make sense. And then a lot of it comes from this project Tether. And so Tether was one of, one of my ideas that uh, uh, I put together in 2014. You know, the idea to put the US dollar on the blockchain, right? To, to give it the capabilities of Bitcoin. Everyone I knew in the industry at the time thought it was a horrible idea, mm -hmm. um, and, but I still did it anyway. <laughs> and uh, I'd call it- It seems to be a, a theme, by the way. <laughs> Yeah. I'd call it a, su a successful social experiment. I mean, it's doing roughly $10 trillion a year of transactional volume. So, I mean, the idea works. Um, let me see if I can close this. I don't have all this light. Yeah, there we go. Um, and so I I'd call it a successful social experiment, even though I'm not happy with all the decisions that have been made, you know, after my departure. Uh, I, I was, you know, my idea was never a, a director or an officer. I never made any money off of the business. I gave 100% of my equity uh, uh, to my minority partners at the time. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's it was one of uh, uh, the many things that I've created that, you know, left the nest early in its life cycle. So, you know, I, I'm, in the I'm in the business of creation. I tend not to stick around very long because I'm off to the next thing. And that's what I've been doing for a long time. And so sometimes I'm really happy with the decisions that, you know, those children make. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes I'm just shaking my head going, oh, <laughs> uh, but you know, that's what happens. These things take on a life of their own. You can't control everything they do. But um, I saw that this idea was being implemented, which was the idea by governments around the world. They started to run pilot projects. Um, and then I started I'm seeing about, how you, you, when you say the idea, you mean central bank digital currencies? Yeah, know, yeah, cent yes, and... yeah, excuse me, yeah. Central banks using this idea of making their currency technology enabled, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and using this type of technology. And I'd gone around the world speaking at conferences and talking to governments and you know proposing this idea and it started to get traction. 
uh, and, and specifically in China. Uh, I mean, China's now has their digital one. And, you know, these things are a big idea. So I decided to go, you know, check in with our government here in the U.S., kind of go meet with, you know, call it some of the senior people upstairs just to find out what's our plan. What are we doing? <laughs> you know, because I, I know a thing or two and I wanted to know because I'm starting to see these ideas take root. Mm. And uh, it was one of the scariest meetings I've ever had. <laughs> okay. uh, I became, it became very clear we had no plan. <laughs> it became very clear we had no clue <laughs> what was going on in the world. Um, I spent that entire night walking around Washington, D.C. going, oh, God, help us. There's no one up top driving the ship. Mm -hmm. There's no hands on the wheel. Mm -hmm. There's and no it's adults the first in the room. It's a weird I, it's, feeling. It, 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 I, I always assumed there were a bunch of pe smart people up top, kind of like making good decisions and have a sense of what's going on. And mm -hmm. this was the first time that I, I became fully aware of the fact that that isn't the case. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, I, I started asking myself, well, if not us, who? Mm -hmm. I guess I'm going to have to do something. I have a moral obligation you know, to, to get involved and do what I can to support our future. And then the question was how? And uh, that eventually led to running for president. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so let, let, let me, let me, I, 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 something occurred to me, which is the, you've always struck me, like I, I mentioned yesterday, like I, I kind of know you, but I don't really know you deeply, but you, you've already struck me as someone with sort of a, universalist outlook like you kind of look at issues on planetary scale or you're interested in like the human progress the human spirit it is there any kind of tension do you feel that between that and a running and what, what surprised me recently is your explicit american patriotism there seems to be a patriotic motiv motivation here as well especially when you're we're talking about other countries and how they're competing with us and i was surprised to be honest, I was surprised to hear you be so explicit. How do you, do you feel that tension? How do you reconcile it? Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? And I think we got a low bandwidth issue for a moment with Brock. Let me see her. So I got, I got to say the fact that he's streaming from a train going from Philadelphia to see Washington DC is kind of impressive, but I, I also get the feeling that in Europe, that would be a no brainer. And that in the US, we get impressed by very little things. Yeah, I, I think he froze for a bit, but he, he'll, he'll come back. I think it's fascinating to hear his story so far, uh, Gordon, just on, on, let's say, his why. You know, what is his in intrinsic motivation to take this task? Because because it's maybe the, the world, one of the world's most demanding jobs or tasks that there can be. But this guy is motivated as, you know, as hell. And, yep. he's, and, he, and he's reinvented himself and done so many new things out of the blue it's kind of amazing yeah and what i like about him i mean we, we had the pre-interview yesterday with him and i really appreciate him i'm grateful that he spends quite some time with us mm -hmm. um uh, in, the, in the in the in the preparation i think he, he dropped out but he will log in again our moderator luke will, will take care of that so no worries folks stay yeah, you, with, you, you stay know what, with while, us. while we're waiting for him uh un luke stokes unmute and turn on Luke Stokes' video, please, because this is a buddy of mine uh, with a good political perspective. Hey, Luke. Or, uh, Luke, unmute yourself or we'll unmute you. Hey, how's it going, everybody? I'm actually. Oh, and then let's, let's let Brock back in, actually. Yeah. Hey, Luke, you, you had your moment there. Um, All right, there we go. Um, we, we went, oh. uh, the, the train went into a, a station and I lost my reception there. Uh, Please uh, forgive me. Um, is that all good? Should I repeat the question or did you hear? It? I, 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 I think I, I got it. Um, uh, I, I caught most of it. And, and so, yes, I'm an American, mm -hmm. but I've also lived all over the world, done business all over the world, and understand that we are all in this together, right? I consider myself a, you know, a citizen also of the earth. <laughs> And so um, 
it's important that we find harmony, you know, between the left and the right, but also between our neighbors and the other nations. We are in this together. What happens to you is going to happen to me. That doesn't mean we have to agree on everything, but we are in this together. So I wouldn't say I view things as competitive, right? I'm, uh, some other nations may do that. I, I operate from the, you know, call it the abundance mindset. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I believe in an all win scenario, creating all win scenarios where we can all win together. Um, and I believe it's possible. Uh, it may require doing things very efficiently and thoughtfully and differently than how we do them presently. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I consider myself very patriotic because I care. You know, I love this country. I love this planet. I love humanity. I am an eternal optimist. I believe in us despite all the mistakes that we've made. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I believe in us. I, I, I believe that we can create a future that we all want to live in if we choose to get involved and make good decisions and choose to be our best selves. And so I, I, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but that was the question I got is the, the, the patriotic sort of side of things. And, you know, how is that at contrast or how does that, you know, what conflict does that create with call it the rest of the world? I don't believe that there is a conflict, right? It's, we have to find a path forward together. We have to find a way to work together. And it's a, uh, or is, let me say, it was more like it was new for me because my normal context with you is big thinker about universal ideas. And it was, I don't know, it was another facet rotating and revealing itself to take such an explicitly, I want to work with America perspective. And it was just, it was just interesting. I'm just observing. Well, yeah. I mean, what happens in America affects the rest of the world. <laughs> so if you care about the world, um, you know, applying yourself, you know, in the, call it nation state system Mm. uh, matters. And these systems are also changing. And I mean, in the same way that technology has changed all of our lives, it's changing all of our businesses, it's affecting every system and it will only continue to do so. And technology is a tool. Technology is neither good nor bad. It's how we use it will determine how it affects us, right? Um, and change is a constant. Mm -hmm. And so I think if ever there was a time that our leadership understood technology, like the need to understand it, it's now. And how we navigate the road ahead. You know, I believe that technology should be here as a tool to enhance our lives and to enhance these systems that support us. And I don't think that that is a, a, a guarantee. It requires skillful you know, navigation of the roads ahead. How do you, so there, there's a certain demographic, you know, and it corresponds highly with crypto and blockchain that likes technology, technology solutions, likes innovation, likes trying new things, likes reworking systems. And then there does seem to be a, a tendency within American society, a separate tendency within American society. I call it the dumb as we want to be tendency. The, or some other people less terribly call the American idiot syndrome, where, you know, I'm not going to wear a mask no matter what, because I have my rights. I don't believe, I, you know, I don't, no vaccines work. You know, there's this thing going on. And do you observe that as well? And then how do we, do we try to bring those people across the river? Or how do we manage that? Well, I, I mean, I think in general, it's a good thing when you question, um, uh, that which is being presented to you as mm-hmm. fact, right? I think it's a very, very good thing that people are waking up to the fact that uh, you need to take responsibility and you need to ask questions. Yep. You know, there's a lot of things that, you know, we're just kind of told, they, they're things that were just done in the past and we're told are good for us that are not necessarily so. You know, I, I love the fact that people are thinking and Mm -hmm. questioning the status quo. And then normally the pendulum swings, right? You go from trusting in the system to then distrusting the system. And then Mm -hmm. you eventually find yourself somewhere back in the balance, right? Uh, uh, Which is normally somewhere, 
Well, yeah. I mean, that's how it, it tends to go, right? I mean, it, 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 you eventually realize that not everything is a lie and not everything is bad for us. Some things are serving us and that it's gray and that it's better. It's, it's causing more benefit than it is harm. And, you know, we go through this sort of process. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then really glad that we're all different. You know, our differences are what makes us unique <laughs> and thank God we're unique. <laughs> right. You know, if we were all the same, this, would, this, this, this reality would be very boring. <laughs> True. And, and, and uh, Gordon, maybe to add, and I think, uh, Brocken, because I fully agree, if we accept that we are all different, right? Because that, that's what this world makes it unique. Everybody's different. You know, we just have to figure out how, how we're going to communi communicate with each other. And I think the point you're, you're making is that when people start to ask questions, you know, what is the reason behind somebody says this is a fact? Well, tell me more about it. This is where pe people uh, uh, get their personal leadership again right this is not to break everything down that happened in the past because everything happened for a reason but it's good to question because then you take you know ownership on your own life you know and we have to build it ourselves and i think it's 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 uh, valuable what you say about your your patriot guy you know you care about your family that's where it starts with you care about your country but you, your country is is the world you know we are all connected we should do it together and maybe you can expand a little bit on the on the fact you said well um, as, as, a, as a future president, but also in business, because you're a serial entrepreneur, you are always striving towards a win-win situation where most opportunities are usually a win-loss situation, but you always do stuff, and you mentioned something about uh, this in the pre-interview, on from a different perspective, you know, not, not with your own perspective, but from a bit a rider perspective. Maybe, I hope you know what I'm referring to. You can add a little bit on, on, on that because we spoke about this yesterday also. And Robert, for your answer, you gave this great left brain, right brain answer, you know, because there was there was the, you, you kind of gave, the, the comment you made about re removing friction by being yeah. selfish. I think that's what we're talking about. Yeah, I, th I think I think his image fro froze a little bit, but he'll he'll be he'll be back. But I, I like the part, Gordon, where where Brock yesterday mentioned that once he goes into let's say making deals, that that can be as a as a government person, but also as a serial entrepreneur, he goes in without making it a win for himself. He looks at it from a from a different perspective. He he, he looks at it: how can everybody be a, a winner? in this conversation in this you know what, whatever we're, we're trying to to create because there's a there's a bigger purpose of the of the things we're doing it uh, and, I, and i think this is this is something where we where can win a lot of votes if we're talking about you know running for president hey brock i think so, so, so brock sorry sanders asking you in relation to a big deal yeah. that you maybe can announce and yeah you yeah, know it's it's to... yeah it's it's out if you want to share it in the chat um, yes. So I, I, it's it's all over the news. It came out yesterday, and so I believe in this concept of all win, right? Mm -hmm. Not just win win, right? So most people are taught in call it this game of life that you know it's about you know for me to win you have to lose because that's what we yeah. you know we play playing games with that sort of basic premise, right? Uh, that's how our sports work. You know, these are, that's just the, the model that is first presented to us. Mm. And then we eventually learn that there are scenarios where we can both win. But I prefer the term all win because that includes every stakeholder, right? Win-win suggests that, you know, maybe the, the leaders are both winning. All win is to make it very clear that we're trying to create scenarios that serve every stakeholder, all the participants, right? Uh, and it's obviously much more difficult to create these all-win scenarios. Um, and so I think the deal that you mentioned was, uh, I've been advising some of the, uh, uh, the top influencers on TikTok. I also started a company with Ryan Kavanaugh uh, who's the, uh, uh, the biggest film financier there's ever been. He started Relativity Media. And I was a seed investor, an angel investor through AngelList in a company called Triller. And so Triller is the main TikTok competitor founded in the US. 
And so Ryan Kavanaugh bought Triller about a year ago, or a majority of it. And so then all of a sudden the U.S. government announced that they might be banning TikTok. The Indian government banned TikTok. Mm -hmm. And Triller then became the number one app in India overnight. And so I'm sitting with, you know, uh, a number of the top influencers on TikTok. And we're having a conversation about the future of TikTok and the fact that TikTok might be shut down in the U.S. And what are they going to do? You know, should we build the new app and try to, to do that? The timetable looks a little too short to actually execute on such a thing. Um, as someone that has developed a few things in my life. Mm -hmm. And I said, and, and, and it's like, okay, well, if, if TikTok were to get shut down, you're probably going to want to migrate to Triller. I said, well, let me call my, my former business partner and let me negotiate a massive deal to make you entrepreneurs and owners of the platform and put you into a position where you have a say in the features and the product and all of that sort of stuff. And, uh, uh, we successfully negotiated that deal. It uh, came out in the press yesterday. And so many of the top influencers on TikTok with, you know, 550 million followers all officially announced their migration off of TikTok and to Triller. Um, it's a deal that's probably going to be worth billions of dollars. <laughs> and so uh, the most important young Generation Z influencers in the country, uh, you know, should all be very happy with me. <laughs> That's amazing. And, and it, it sounds like you mentored them. And by the way, and, and Josh Richards, who's probably the most influential of them, is now the chief strategic officer of Triller. So, I mean, wow. and he's, eight, he's 18 years old. And okay. so... Uh, <laughs> it's, what have it, I done it, with my life? Yes. <laughs> well, but what an amazing thing. You know, these are the most yeah. influential young people in the world today. And the fact that they understand the responsibility of you know th that all these people are watching what they do and how they do it and learning from it and that they're putting forth a good example of how to you know do ethical business how to become entrepreneurial and uh i mean it's, it's just it's a it's a beautiful thing to watch i am so honored uh to sit in the center of you know uh this transformation and change and it's also a really interesting example of how, you know, the government was talking about banning TikTok mm -hmm. and how uh, these young influencers all banded together and um, essentially are leading the migration off of TikTok before the government even did anything. Mm -hmm. It goes to show you how much power, you know, we can have, you know, I did this in a single phone call. That's Awesome. And it also kind of exposes one of the elephants in the room, which is you obviously have a love and appreciation for China, the country, China, the Chinese people and Chinese society, but you can't avoid talking about China as a pure competitor to the United States if you're making a presidential run. And that kind of relates to the TikTok aspect. Can you, can you adjust the, the China question from your perspective? Yeah, I, I, to be very clear, I've spent a lot of my life living in China. Um, and, you know, for my, my 20s, I was building businesses in the virtual world. Um, I built up a supply chain of, you know, maybe 400,000 or so people that would play video games professionally to mine digital currency in games like World of Warcraft and Second Life and such. Most Did of those ITV? people were, yeah, most of those people were, Mm -hmm. Yes. And most of those people were in China. Mm -hmm. um, I started a television channel in China in 2004. Uh, we were instrumental in launching Alipay in China. I used to carry Chinese government cards. <laughs> I mean, uh, I've done a lot of things in China. I love the Chinese people. I love Chinese culture. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of my life living in China. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very complicated situation we're in. You know, the world's two great superpowers, you know, uh, finding themselves in a state of some degree of conflict. And I think if, if ever there was a moment in time where 
the decisions leadership make, the, the decisions we make in leadership and how we interact and how we find a path forward. I mean, if ever there was a moment in time where it's like absolutely critical, this is it. Um, I'd say that the experience I have in China makes me well suited uh, uh, to find a path forward that is an all win scenario. We clearly do not want uh, you know, conflict with China escalating to a, uh, uh, and, and nor should they, you know, it's, it, but it, it, this, is a, this is a very difficult, you know, it's not a game of chess, it's a game of go. Um, I'm a gamer. And so uh, my, my, my favorite game these days is go. Uh, which are, if, if you're not familiar with that, that's basically a much more advanced version of chess, but Chinese. Sure. Well, how, how do you, I mean, I, I, I hear you about the all win approach and that resonates. I think some of the Chinese government have the win all approach, <laughs> which is it's all for us. It's zero sum. And it's not enough that we win. You must lose because we're, you know, the, the middle kingdom and there can only be one object in the middle. And we'll work with you while we're ascending, but make no mistake about our end goals. Is that, it, there's at least some elements of the government that feel that way. How do you, how do you work with, with someone like that? Yeah. Um, you know, Sandra, every time I ask the zinger. No. Is the dance? <laughs> I'm in a hard time <laughs> understanding you. I've got lots of reception. Well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try it again. There we go. Uh, yeah, if you can repeat that question for me. Sure. You know, you, you have a great all-win philosophy. I think there's definitely at least elements in the Chinese government that have a win-all philosophy, which is we're going to win everything and not share, and we're on our way to becoming the Middle Kingdom once again. And, you know, you quote from Highlander, there can be only one. So how do you interact with someone who believes that or thinks that way? Well, I mean, we don't always get to pick the rules of the game, right? Um, sometimes you have to play the game that others are presenting. Um, have you ever played a game with me? No. I can play your game. Um, and so, you know, if China wants to play a game that is all for China and nothing for everyone else. I mean, I can play that game very well. Um, I'm, I'm pretty good at every game. <laughs> uh, and so hopefully we, we find a, 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 a peaceful, mutually prosperous path forward. But, you know, I believe we're, we'll end up there. The question is, you know, what is the process to getting there? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I, I pray we find a, uh, a path forward where we all win. Uh, but I, I agree. It's not so simple as, uh, you know, you know, we're, we're in a very comp we're in a very challenging situation. Um, and how we find a path forward that doesn't lead to greater conflict is, is, is not a simple thing. Um, Fair enough. The, so let, let, let me shift gears a little bit. You, you've, you've done so many different things. And I guess from Mighty Ducks to entrepreneurship, you know, there's, there's a vast leap of going into business and not just once, but so many other times. What, is it your DNA? Did you, did you decide you wanted to go that direction? Like how, how did this, Let's do a little bit of biography. How did this evolve? How did your approach take root and then blossom to innovation and business and everything else? Well, so I, I grew up as an actor um, from the ages of three to 16. I was acting. At the age of 15, I was experience, experiencing fame because at that point I was starring in movies. Uh, major motion pictures, um, you know, probably the most notable of which was I made a movie called First Kid, yeah. where I played the son of the president of the United States, and Sinbad was my Secret Service agent. Mm -hmm. And and following that film's release, I was like, wow, being famous is not all that fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I don't 
like everyone knowing me and everyone wanting to, you know, me to sign autographs everywhere I go and everyone watching everything I do, it's like, okay, this is not so cool. Mm -hmm. And so at 15, I, I started asking myself the question is, because I didn't choose to be an actor. I was acting at the age of three, but I asked your, myself, your is this, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I didn't know, um, you know, is this what I want to be doing? Mm -hmm. And I decided that this wasn't my calling. You know, I, I wanted to write my own script. I wanted to be the director of my own life. I wanted to create things. And mm -hmm. so based upon the world I had grown in, grown up in, I'm like, oh, I want to become the producer. I want to be the person making the movies, creating mm -hmm. these movies, assembling, you know, being the entrepreneur behind these movies. And then at the age of 16, having been a, a you know, a byproduct of the first generation of kids with computers and internet and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. At 16, I'm like, I want to be an internet entrepreneur. This internet thing is going to change the world. And I had no idea how to go about doing this, but it started when I was 16. Wow. And okay. then uh, I, I started uh, building businesses and then I started running businesses and then started building more businesses and running businesses and building businesses. And I realized that operating businesses was not my, it wasn't my preference. Um, I really enjoyed the process of birthing. I really enjoyed the process of creation. Mm -hmm. And which is, is a challenging thing because, you know, the mindset that most of us have as entrepreneurs, if we don't stay involved in the business and protect our equity, right, to defend our position, mm -hmm. that we'll be taken advantage of and lose our money. And, and there's a degree of truth to that, right? Which is why we often stay with things for a long time. If you leave the castle unattended to, you know, <laughs> eventually, you know, people might uh, uh, take a reach for the things that you have. And so I just decided that um, I didn't care. Um, I didn't care really what was in it for me. Mm -hmm. I really just loved the, uh, uh, the process of creating. And if you create enough things, you win some, you lose some. Uh, I find that, uh, well, I've done just fine. I, I, I think I've done quite well. <laughs> right. And more than anything, I've had the pleasure of, helping to create a lot of things that have, you know, been successful. I mean, in, in just our industry, right. All at this last decade, you know, I, uh, I was not to be the founding chairman of MasterCoin, where we invented the ICO. I think that's another successful experiment that's disrupting the, the world of capital formation. Mm -hmm. I, I got to co-found blockchain capital, the first venture fund dedicated to the sector that funded mm -hmm. all, you know, many of the, the great companies in the space. I got to co-found Tether, um, got to start co-found the first crypto bank in Puerto Rico. Uh, I, I with think you, you talk got, about, that's a current project, yes? Or uh, no, no, Noble, Noble Bank, no, yeah, Noble Bank um, uh, didn't work out in the end. Uh, uh, the, the, the CEO that I hired uh, uh, for that business made a couple of, bad decisions when things were growing rapidly. I mean, this is not uncommon when uh, uh, growing really, really fast um, uh, can lead to struggles. <laughs> um, the, the, the challenges in, in building something out of nothing are uh, uh, cut both ways, meaning not getting traction can obviously be very harmful, but becoming too successful too quickly can also lead to failure um, mm -hmm. as a counterintuitive as that might be. But um, uh, yeah, I'm involved in another crypto bank, which is, you can check it out. Uh, I'll drop the, uh, the link in there. It's Medici Bank. As I like to say, the uh, Medici family started the first bank and they're back to start the last bank. That was a, uh, can, can you give it, you know, you, you shared a pretty interesting anecdote of how you interacted with a certain Medici in the formation of that bank. Can you share that with us? Yeah, yeah. so uh, I, and I've been knighted, you know, one of those old uh, things that they do <laughs> for people that are in service to humanity and protecting, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> the people that are in need of protection. It's one of those honors they bestow on people that live their lives nightly. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, and so, uh, uh, I, I've gotten to know a bunch of these sort of Italian old world sort of families. And, uh, one of them happens to be uh, Prince Lorenzo de Medici. And so, mm-hmm. uh, uh, I, I connected him with the CEO, uh, of that business at Boyle and, and suggested that that's the brand we go with. <laughs> and cause I'm a storyteller. I believe that, you know, a big part of making things successful is having a compelling story to tell. Yeah. Uh, uh, cause that's what, you know, really kind of breathes life into things, right? The more compelling the story, the easier it is for you to tell people about it and for people to remember it. And, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of very rational and logical reasons why good storytelling is of great utility. And so, you know, I, I, again, I came from a, an entertainment background, right? Back to writing the script. I, I, I enjoy the, the writing of the story. And so, uh, um, yeah, I, I don't know if that answered your question. I, I obviously didn't dig deep into the, the things that I've done, but also got to do BCAP where we invented the security token, which I think is going to matter. Mm-hmm. You know, block one in EOS obviously was another sort of big success. And there's probably another hundred or so projects in there that I'm not mentioning. Uh, like I never have idle hands. I am you, always You're going to mention that doing. even the people who know you well don't see the whole view oh, of what you're doing. Oh, my, my so own. Crazy. Yeah, my own. Yeah, my own. My own yeah. team, like the key people that run my core business. Mm-hmm. You know, like kind of like a family office. They're like always working, and my own team is like Brock. We 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 don't fully understand all that you do. Like no one can ever kind of. I do so much that no one can really ever see the whole picture, mm-hmm. um, because the amount of time it would just take to inform one person you know, would take away from my ability to get this done. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, I'm moving that fast. The, Brock, the, the, those guys that are, that are in your inner circle, they're still following you. So the, the, they see the vision, they see the strategy on where you're going to. What is the main thing, or maybe the top two things, why they are following you, although they don't understand or see all the details that you already see uh, because you've been working on it for, for such a long time. What is it that attracts them in your, in your team? Well, I mean, the, 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 the core people that I work with um, tend to be very competent and very successful in whatever it is that they've done historically. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I, I don't want to speak for others, but um, I'd say that most of the people that work with me um, have a, a higher calling, right? They are in service to something more than themselves. And I think the common thread is they see that I am ever in service to the greater good, mm-hmm. the benefit of all. And, you know, as people that measure themselves by the positive impact they're having in the world, you know, it's a team, right? Even like the president, the president isn't really a person, it's an office, right? And it's comprised of a team of people. Um, I might be the outwardly facing, you know, individual, but it's, uh, uh, it, this is obviously a much bigger thing than just me. And so I'm very blessed to have extraordinary um, people that work with me uh, to support you know, all the things that we're collectively, you know, doing. So, Brock, following up on that, you, you have this skill, talent, tendency to meet people, uncover something in them that they didn't even know that they had, inter- make a brief, you know, intercession with them, if that's the right word, or intervention with them, and then they seem to careen off on some other course, whether it's moving to Puerto Rico, or starting a business or something. What the heck is that? <laughs> it, it, it seems to well, be, I, I hear from first people again and again and again. I talked to Brock and X and they didn't really know <laughs> it was coming. Yeah. 
Well, um, I think that we all have the potential for greatness. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I like to think that we all have the potential to be superheroes. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that uh, I've been able to do is help people find their greatness. Mm -hmm. You know, help people believe more in themselves and realize that they have a purpose and that their life really has meaning. And, uh, and I think I've, I, I help inspire people to, to unlock their greatest or truest potential. And uh, I mean, what a wonderful thing. You know, we really only have the power to change ourselves. But by changing ourselves and by being our best selves, we have the power to inspire others to be their best selves. Mm -hmm. And as we redefine and improve ourselves, you know, we collect and redefine and improve ourselves as a collective. And through that process, we can make the really great and important changes in the world, you know, at a time where our future, the decisions we collectively make over of this next decade is going to determine the fate for all of humanity. Indeed. So, it, but my, you know, it just occurred to me, you're like, you're human ayahuasca, which is someone takes you and all of a sudden they, un, they it's not they get in touch deeper with something you already knew was there. It's like this other thing comes out that they had no idea was there. And like, whoosh, you know, they do a 180. It's kind of, yeah. So do, they, they, here's, a, here's an analogy, right? Mm -hmm. All it takes is one candle in a dark room <laughs> to, light. to light up the entire thing, right? And as, and it only takes that one light to light up another light. You know, think of all of us as candles. Mm -hmm. And I try to radiate light. Mm -hmm. And I, through that, sometimes ignite a spark mm -hmm. or a light in others. You know, and I, I, I like to think that we can light up the world. I like it. Now, one of the one of the persistent things I hear is I've talked to Brock and moved to Puerto Rico, and then things are happening. Can you tell us brass tacks your about your involvement in Puerto Rico, the foundation, to the extent that's a lab for for what you are now doing with your presidential run? G give us give us some context, Puerto Rico specifically. Um, yeah, so I, I spent time in Puerto Rico as a teenager, and then I uh, set up this uh, bank in Puerto Rico in uh, 2014 and became very familiar with, you know, call it the, 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 the nuances of the rules in Puerto Rico. And then I started realizing that people were following me and that people would go far out of their way to travel to wherever I, I was uh, and not in small numbers and, and really interesting people, people that, you know, had lots of intellectual capital or human capital or financial capital or spiritual capital. And so as a, you know, kind of a data scientist or a data driven um, uh, decision maker, I started to run, you know, tests. Mm -hmm. And I started to see, you know, okay, people would be like, Brock, let me know the next time you're going to be in Europe. And I'd be like, okay, I'll be in London or I'll be in Berlin or I'll be in Barcelona or I'll be in Spain, you know, or Ibiza. And mm -hmm. I started seeing that, you know, what the conversion rates were of what cities people would travel to. And I started realizing that, wow, people will go where I go in a meaningful way. And then that it's became- Especially with the visa, right? Yes, like a 90% conversion rate during the, 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 the warm months, <laughs> which is why I, we bought this ancient farm I've been working on there for four or five years uh, and restoring these runes or what you'd call a finca, um, which sadly, as soon as it was made nice, I haven't had time to go. It, it feels like the story of my life. I go around the world building beautiful things, and as soon as they're like comfortable, um, I'm off to the next thing and everybody else is the beneficiary of it, but you know, it's all good. 
you know, I, I basically spent time on the farm when there was no running water and it was like, <laughs> it was yeah. not pleasant. And now that it's nice, I obviously have no time to be there. Um, but uh, uh, once I realized that people would go where I would go, I, 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 real, I took that as a, as a very, very serious responsibility. I'm like, whoa, now that I know this, I, I can't live in Los Angeles or New York or London or I'm like, if people are willing to go where I go, if people are willing to move where I move, I probably should go somewhere mm -hmm. that could make a difference. That could have a material impact on the world or the place where I am. And that I, I didn't have to think about it for more than a second. I'm like, okay, I, I guess I'm moving to Puerto Rico because I believe I can convince largest number of people to also follow me or join me there because mm -hmm. um, I'm just one small man there's only so much I can do myself you know every great thing I've ever done in my life has been with other people you know <laughs> um, and so um, uh, I moved to Puerto Rico I, I made the decision to move to Puerto Rico and then Hurricane Maria hit and I wasn't planning to move for another year or so but I recognized that well, if I'm planning to move to Puerto Rico to, 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 to attempt to make a positive impact, mm -hmm. this is clearly the moment uh, where the need is greatest. So it's not convenient for me, but, you know, time to go. <laughs> and so I, I moved to Puerto Rico and I've been living there for, um, you know, a little more than two and a half years and uh, trying to do everything I possibly can from a, uh, an impact investment perspective uh, from a philanthropic perspective and, and just an anthropological sort of studying sort of perspective, you know, really trying to understand why things are the way they are. You know, why is there a food security problem? Why is the energy grid failing? Why are the energy prices so high? You know, why, uh, why are all of the, why are there so few Puerto Rican brands and why is it all U.S. franchises and why are unemployment rates the way they are and just kind of going through all of that stuff and then trying to understand through that research, you know, what could I do? What can I do? What would I do if I was in a position of authority? Um, and what can I do as, a, as an individual, you know, uh, and how can I be of service? So do, do you feel that your Puerto Rican efforts have borne fruit yet, or are they pending, or is it mostly, you know, that thing where you're finding the other, the other and the other and turning it on? Where, where are you in the, I think I, I, that's your announcement in the back, right? Yeah, uh, we're, we're pulling into Washington, D.C., so bear with me as I... Not walk uh to the car i'm now in a, i'm in the nation's capital <laughs> yeah hopefully to stay um so well i i did buy a house here um uh, and 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 not just any house uh i by the way i bought it sight on scene so i'm about to see my home in dc for the first time but uh according to the real estate people and the press i guess that they got put out it's the it's the largest apartment or penthouse in all of dc so uh, 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 not a minor place. Um, it was owned by that uh, basketball player, uh, Dwight Howard, who was on the Wizards that got transferred to the Lakers. So he no longer needed his house here in D.C. And it was built in 1894. And so it looks like it's right in the heart of Capitol Hill. It's right on Maryland. So it's right on the street that leads right into the U.S. Capitol. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, I can walk down the street into the Capitol building. And uh, it looks like a castle. And, and it's named after the 14th president of the United States, Franklin Pierce. And so the castle oh. says Pierce School. <laughs> That's an interesting coincidence okay, or, or coincidence. <laughs> yeah, coincidence. No yeah, we, so you were kind enough to take it off his hands. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, so let, 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 let me re-ask the question. In terms of your Puerto Rico work, uh, is this stuff bearing fruit now? Is this stuff that will bear fruit over time? What, 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 where are you in the process? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's bearing fruit. It's bearing, it's, it's bearing fruit in the sense that um, a, a meaningful number of people have moved to Puerto Rico. 
And these are people that are buying homes or investing in businesses or giving money to charity, just putting money into the local economy, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm working with startups and trying to um, support the entrepreneurial ecosystem, which, uh, you know, is, is pretty nascent. It doesn't take much to, to really change the game uh, in that regard. Um, uh, bringing businesses, uh, uh, for example, there's a, a company called Coco Taps. Uh, Coco Vinny, you may have seen him on the Shark Tank or the Profit. Mm -hmm. uh, he's relocating his business to, to Puerto Rico to support the, um, the startup ecosystem or the agriculture and food security business in Puerto Rico. Um, just got to, I'm going to have to talk to the mask kids right, for a moment. Um, I'm just going to let them through because I have a lot of stuff. One second. No problem. You know, we, I think we got a large international audience for this. So, you know, welcome, welcome to America. We are on, we're still on lockdown and we're probably going to go to lockdown phase two for the soon. Uh, if there's any time we need some leadership, this is probably it. Um, exciting times. I think our European and Asian audience is doing much better than we are. So, Sandra, when you go outside, do you wear a mask? Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. We, we are very uh, precautious uh, still in, uh, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, where I am. But we are in a, in a, in a bit of a softer lockdown now, so people can go outside. Yes, a bit, a bit more. Has... Yeah. Well, I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, uh, on a philanthropic level, our foundation is called the Integro Foundation, which in Spanish has two meanings, integrity and integration. The idea being to integrate with integrity. And we've done a bunch of stuff. We started out in our first year connecting people and hosting events that allowed me to explore the island. Last year, we were very involved in supporting uh, nearly 40 grassroots philanthropic organizations, really just to understand the, the breadth of, call it the needs uh, we got very involved in supporting our neighbors in the Bahamas uh, when they got hit by um, the hurricane. A lot of work in Abacos, building housing, feeding people. And, uh, and this year, you know, we've really been scaling our philanthropic work. Um, uh, formed a partnership with Binance mm -hmm. to deliver a uh, million dollars worth of masks to Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic and Haiti and uh, the Navajo Nation and the Amazon indigenous tribes. Uh, we also uh, were buying a lot of food from farmers and delivering it to families in need during this period of time where people haven't been able to work. Uh, we've also gotten very involved in lots of preservation work. I think we're the main non-government financier of protecting the endangered Puerto Rican parrot. We're now supporting the manatee. I think we're about to be supporting uh, uh, the koki frog, the endangered ver uh, uh, specimens or, or species of frogs. You know, so we're up and down doing everything we possibly can to be, uh, to be of service. Interesting. The, any, let, me, let, let me think how to frame this question. So when you come to Puerto Rico, you know, and start to take action like this. I, I imagine there's some element of who the heck is this guy and what does he think he's doing? And here you are the complete outsider in the presidential race. And no doubt some people are, are gonna think, you know, who the heck is this guy and what does he think he's doing? How do you, the people who have that kind of reaction, like who is this outsider in our space? Do you get that? Uh, how do you handle oh, it? Yeah. What do you do? Oh, de yeah, definitely. And I, um, I made a mistake. Um, definitely made a major misstep when I first, you know, uh, arrived in Puerto Rico. I was definitely not sensitive to uh, um, the islands, uh, sort of just nature of how they uh, perceive newcomers and. You know, I was the kind of flamboyant, uh, 
you know, go getter, big idea. And, uh, you know, if I was doing that all over again, I would have been, I, I obviously didn't try to uh, engage with any of the media. They, they did what they did. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in Puerto Rico, I would have, I would have waited until I accomplished a lot more uh, before allowing the, uh, that story to get out. But, you know, I'm, uh, I've now been there two and a half years and I don't think there's any dispute <laughs> around the things that I've done. But uh, it's definitely one of those places, um, less talk, more action, talk, talk after you've delivered kind of places. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, you live and you learn. I've made mistakes. And I've learned from those mistakes. And I'm, and unlike most politicians, I'm willing to admit that I made mistakes and I'll take responsibility yeah. for the, the mistakes that I've made and I'll learn from them and I'll tell you what I've learned and how it's affected or changed my behavior. So maybe-, that, maybe that, Brock, that, That's shocking. <laughs> as, as a side question, Brock, because we're, mm -hmm. we're discussing on learning from mistakes, right? So it's actually not mistakes, it's a learning experience. But what is the, let's say, the, one of the biggest mistakes, what is the, the biggest learning things that you, that you experienced within the last 12 months or so? G give us some insights on that. Okay, what are uh, the biggest mistakes I've made in the last 12 months? Uh, or I mean, uh, mistakes that, and learning experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I was uh, hosting a little dinner for um, uh, people the other night in, in New York and, you know, dealing with, you know, friends and potential supporters of what we're doing. And one of my really good friends, you know, came to dinner late and so missed a lot of the, uh, the earlier part of the conversation. And, and because we're really good friends, I didn't think anything of it, but uh, there was the perception, uh, at least amongst one of my friends, that I was you know, being a little hard on this very dear friend of mine, uh, maybe a little impatient, not in a way that was noticeably wrong, but it's, you know, I want to be the best person I can. And this is someone clearly I, I, you know, I care a great deal about, been a friend of mine for a long time. And so, um, you know, I, I have to constantly remind myself, you know, to, to be the best person I can be. And so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's good. And I'm, I'm really happy when my, uh, uh, friends and family and people I work with will also point out when I've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I don't want to be surrounded by people that just kind of let you get away with less than good behavior. You know, if I make a mistake, please bring it to my attention mm -hmm. so that I can learn from it so that I can address it. You know, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I think it's really important that we choose friends and surround ourselves with people that will tell us when we're straying from path. Mm -hmm. yeah. is, is this also a, a characteristics of the, the people you, that you surround yourself with also within your team now by, with running by president that you don't have only have the yay-sayers, people that, that just say everything yes to whatever you do or that they're also critical, they give you feedback yeah, I, I, I don't surround myself with yes people, but I also don't surround myself with negative people either, right? Sure. There's, there's constructive criticism, right? Solution-oriented, you know, critiquing, right? It's like, hey, you know, this just giving you, it, it's called I'm pointing things out to bring it to your attention mm -hmm. so that you can learn from it, you know, not just people being like, you know, bad, 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 bad. I, I try to avoid... Um, people that are uh, consistently negative or draining. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, um, but at, at the same time, you, you, you want people that are there to help build you up, right? We, we stand on the shoulders of giants and, uh, uh, and it, that doesn't just happen automatically. It, it comes through intentional, skillful um, action. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, Brock, we, we, we've gotten a few questions in the chat. 
regarding your how you select you know there's a billion startups out there you're i guess you're involved in a hundred of them at any one time how do you what 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 is your process vetting or otherwise for becoming involved in startups either as an investor as a mentor or somehow what just talk to us about that process yeah so for me i'm mostly interested in things that have never been done before so if you're doing if, if you're doing something that somebody else has already done successfully you know that just doesn't get me very excited right mm -hmm. i'm excited by things that have never been done before and that are truly game changing you know that are, are really going to disrupt the status quo in a way that is ultimately beneficial or positive um and so that's kind of, I'd say, you know, from an idea perspective, big ideas that change the game. Um, and then at the end of the day, life is short or short enough that I only want to work with people I enjoy spending time with. And so um, most of the projects I get involved in are ones where I've decided that I really like the people. And, you know, because I'm going to have to spend a lot of time with them. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think those are the, the main two things, right? You know, it's the people, who they are. Do I enjoy their company? Do I believe in them? Do they inspire me? Do I think that they've got the tenacity, you know, necessary to succeed? You know, and then, you know, what's the mission? <laughs> you know, what's the purpose? What are we, why are we doing this? What are we setting out to do? And how is it going to change the world? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, over the course of my life, that has become more and more refined. You know, in my younger years, I, I did things sometimes just because it sounded like it would be very profitable. You know, I was motivated. Uh, money back then motivated me. Money is not really a motivating factor for me anymore. Money, my, money is just the byproduct of doing things well. But I'm not, I don't even really like take it into consideration other than thinking through, you know, that business's ability to sustain itself and raise capital. But, you know, from a personal perspective, it's not like, not something that I like, it doesn't motivate me. It's, it, it, it's, it's one of those, I actually find in some ways, the less you focus on making money in, in at least in my case, the more I seem to make of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, well, you, it's you made uh, an interesting point that, you know, at the inception of a project, there's kind of like this golden moment that if you're selfless, then it's friction reducing, but if you're yeah. traditional, go on. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, um, and a lot of times when I'm involved in the, uh, the, the, the creation phase at this point, I'm not even, I, I, I don't even, even if I'm a, it's my idea and I'm the founder, right. Uh, or it's my idea. I'll be sitting with some people and they'll be pitching me some idea and I'll be like, um, okay. And maybe I'm not like loving the, the, the idea they're proposing. And I'll say, well, let's talk about this idea. And I'll put something out that I've been thinking about for a while. And then they might be like, Oh my God. That's amazing. Wow, maybe we should do that instead. And then, you know, we'll, we'll have the conversation, have the conversation. Eventually, they're like, oh, my God, yes, we want to do this. I'm like, great, you should do that. And they're like, um, so how much, you know, how much of the company do you would want? we get? What would, how much would we get? Like thinking it's mine, right? I'm like, what do you mean? You can have all of it. And they're like, well, what about you? What do you want? I go, nothing. It's just an idea. I've got infinite, basically good ideas, or at least ideas, maybe not all of them good, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, and they're like, but, but we want to do this with you. I go, you know, we want your help. I'm like, am I not helping right now? They're like, but you don't want anything. I'm like, not really. I mean, uh, in, in three to six months, if you've decided that like I've added a lot of value and I've made it had a material impact on the success of your business, if you want to give me something, you can. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Okay. And I go, but by the way, if you give me nothing, I probably will help you just as much. <laughs> They're like, it, 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 but the reason why I found this to be effective is I've eliminated the friction of me from the equation. Like how many times could you be sitting around a table talking about a, an idea and because you asked for too much, the other party chose not to do it. When you tell the other party, oh, you can have it all. What is the likelihood of the other party saying, yes, let's, I want to do this. I, I've just increased the odds of that party wanting to do something to the maximum degree possible, mm -hmm. right? And then when they're like, but I want your help, I'm like, 
I'm going to help you, you know? So I then further increase the odds of them wanting to do it. And I've also shown that I'm like, like a very helpful, non-demanding, supportive sort of participant, which then probably further adds to the likelihood of them wanting to do it. And, uh, you know, so it's, I've eliminated the friction of me from the equation, which means the odds of the things that I'm working on manifesting into reality is, you know, increasing exponentially. It's why I've been at the forefront of so many, I think, important innovations, because I'm not busy selfishly fighting over what's in it for me. Mm -hmm. And I found I've done just fine. And so, um, uh, you know, obviously there are projects where I, I've probably been a major contributor and I've not done well, um, and that's fine. But I've done enough things that, you know, it's, it's, it's all worked out for me. I, I have more than I need. Uh, I, I, I live in abundance and, uh, uh, and I'm consistently able to support causes and people that I, I, I think are worthy of such support. How, how much of that is, you know, I, I got a chicken egg question, which is how much of that is a result of previously being focused on money, reaping the rewards and now being set in that department so you can take a broader look and how much of it is sort of sui generis, you know, this is your personality or character anyway. And it, it's cool that it's playing out this way. I, I found that I'm making more money the less I'm focused on it. Um, mm -hmm. It's also there's this idea um, uh, that comes from you know a number of sort of religious backgrounds. It's this idea that the more you give, the more you get. You know, you for whatever you get away give away, it comes back tenfold. In my own life experience, that is true. Like I find the more I give, the more I get. And, uh, and I, I, I give with no expectation of receiving anything in return. And it might just be, there might be this karmic sort of like rule that is why that is, or it just might be because you're a kind, generous, loving people, more opportunities present themselves to you. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, or, or both are true, right? There's the, the, the spiritual and, the, and, and, and then the physical of this, you know, sort of 3D reality. And uh, I, I could make arguments, you know, from both perspectives as, as to why that is. But a minimum, if you go around doing good things in the world, always taking care of people, you know, having open arms, open heart, uh, you know, you're going to be invited to more opportunities. And when there's a crowd of people trying to participate in, in, in a specific opportunity. Um, oh, this is, uh, I'm at my new house. I bought it sight on scene. So, uh you guys are going to chance to see it, I guess, exactly at the same time that I'm seeing it for the first time. But, wow, um, yeah, you know, breaking news here. <laughs> okay, and uh, so I didn't know that there's art in the yard. There's a bunch of like uh, flower sculptures that look a little bit like something you'd see in the desert at Burning Man. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me shift gears as you kind of give us the video of the, the house. Uh, Luke, technical friend. Uh, please unmute and, un and show the video for Luke Stokes. Luke Stokes oh, is part of our alumni speaker group. And I, Luke, uh, unmute yourself or other Luke, please unmute Luke. There you go. So the, the flag is missing, but there you can see the entrance. Wow, that looks presidential. Looks like, does that say public school? No, it Pierce. says Pierce okay. School, Pierce yeah. School. yeah. Yeah. And so it's this brick like castle uh, on Maryland. I like it. I, uh, Brock, if, if, if you can, if you can, I'm excited for you. We're going we're gonna to try to get Luke, Luke, you have like, a, I think a few minutes. So if you, if you wanted to, you know, say something. Come on in. Yeah, sure. No, th thank you, Gordon. I, I do have a board meeting coming up for Theo in a couple minutes, but um, I just, as someone who did move to Puerto Rico, and ironically, I kind of moved here prior to meeting Brock in person. You know, I saw him at conferences and stuff, but we met after I moved here, and he came uh, to my house, and we got to get to know each other a little bit, and we worked together for a while on a project with a, a, an idea for a DAO for EOS, uh, an EOS Foundation didn't end up going the direction we, we all kind of thought in the beginning, but it was an amazing experience and I got to know him and his team 
And it also kind of just reminded me uh, just how difficult this space is. The, the cryptocurrency blockchain space as far as accomplishing anything uh, massive and in the real world. And, and so I, I guess I, I have a question for Brock if, if you're still on there. Um, one, hello, and I mean, congrats on everything you're doing. The building there looks amazing. But two, just your thoughts on, as an industry, what we can do for usability. How can we can help blockchain become more real to everyday people? But like, as an example, someone in, in the Act 2022 group here just had their bank account frozen because they were trying to send their IRS payment. And it was just this incredible thing. And they're realizing they knew intellectually that Bitcoin was important, but they didn't know it, really know it, until they had their money taken from them in a way they couldn't control it. So, so Bitcoin and, and blockchain and cryptocurrency and these DAX and DAOs, these systems of governance that I know you and I are both passionate about, how, what are your thoughts on how we can make this easy enough for everyday people to use? Because until these technologies are as simple as Facebook and Twitter and all these centralized systems people are familiar with, you know, how, how are we going to make them practical in everyday lives to actually improve people's lives? Because I think that's a passion you have. I think it's a passion I have, but we haven't yet seen it yet. You know, it's 10 years. It's an early industry, but the solutions are being asked for right now. As the financial industry collapses, as our systems of governance oh. are failing at their job, how can we make these systems more effective today? Yeah, well, um, uh, Luke, it's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, for those that don't know him, he's... Uh, uh, just an extraordinary um, individual who operates with integri integrity with a capital I, you know, real principled, solid core values. And so, um, you know, Luke is uh, one of those wonderful people that uh, I encourage everyone to follow, to connect with. And, uh, and Luke is, yes, in Puerto Rico with his wonderful family. And uh, yeah, why does this technology matter? I mean, clearly, uh, uh, you know, the, the potential for ubiquitous financial inclusion, and this is technology in general, it doesn't need to be blockchain or crypto per se, uh, if done correctly, though um, clearly I'm a, a believer in this uh, distributed system that is censorship resistant, certainly when it comes to things like your money and uh, someone having the potential to take that away, but also the benefits of speed, right? And uh, efficiency and lower fees. So I, I certainly think that the, the, uh, the utility around improving on money is, is very real. And so, uh, um, and Puerto Rico is a great place to, uh, uh, to roll out some of these experiments. I think it's more around I think the bigger opportunity for Puerto Rico in, in the context of this technology is really around uh, a peer-to-peer -peer resilient, you know, call it distributed power grid, you know, renewable energies. You've got, you know, nearly 340 days of sunlight. Uh, energy costs are over 30 cents per kilowatt hour. And so the idea of solar-based renewable resilient grid is like an absolute no-brainer. Puerto Rico, I think, could be the capital of sort of renewable energy in the U.S. and should be. Uh, the benefits are clearly there in a very big way. Uh, Luke, did that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think you, you touched on uh, things that are, you know, I think we both agree that these technologies are really, really important. I think one of the challenges I've seen in the you know, seven and a half years I've been in this space is making them accessible. Uh, easy, simple, you know, uh, you know, I'm working with the Foundation for Inner Wallet Operability. That's just one example. You know, I've been working with EOS DAC, trying to build DACs, make those easier is another example for governance. Just making blockchain and cryptocurrency simpler for people because they're used to these simple experiences with PayPal, Venmo. They're used to, you know, things that just are centralized, but the, the, they're, they haven't actually experienced in most cases the pain points of when those centralized systems go bad, you know, when they get shadow banned, when they get demonetized, when they get kicked off their favorite social media. As you know, I've been on Hive as well, kind of like promoting decentralized, uncensorable social media platforms. So I think I see the benefit of it, but I'm a technologist. You know, I, I majored in computer science. I, I have a background in this stuff so I can figure it out when it's complicated. And so I'm, I'm, I've even, you know, I've talked a little bit with your team at, at one point about different ideas for how we can introduce cryptocurrency and blockchain to people that are following your campaign. And one of the challenges I face is that these technologies are just really difficult. They're still early on. It's like the internet 
you know, was around for 10 years before you had a protocol like HTTP to make it easier and have interfaces and browsers and stuff. And so as far as like the storytelling and then the actual implementation, we're just curious what, what, what uh, inspiration you can give to other blockchain and governance and, and decentralized social media, people in this space trying to build real solutions, what inspiration can you give them to help the human factor of it, to make it easy, make it simple, create better UI and, and UX, user experience, user interface? Because I do feel like that's what's kind of missing. It's a bunch of kind of geeky, nerdy guys all going, hey, look at this cool technology we built. And everyone's like, okay, that's all great, but like, it's too hard to understand. I can't use it. I can't figure out MetaMask. And you know, managing my private keys is too hard, and these big public addresses don't make sense. You know, any thoughts you have on that to inspire us? I'd, I'd appreciate. It. Yeah. So, I mean, I definitely think that uh, as an industry, we're not really ready for prime time, in the sense we haven't created user experiences that are um, workable for the you know, call it the average person. And so, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm excited by the project, your project, Theo, is anything we can do to improve upon the usability and, and security that is, you know, again, doesn't require a high degree of technical experience. You know, that has to happen before crypto will really take off in a major way. All right. So good. Uh, Luke, I know you got a board meeting. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass the mic. Um, Thank you, guys. Uh, take care. Thanks, Luke. That was, that was great. So we're we're gonna actually bring on Von Dallin. Frank is an investor in Iconic. I, I also ha have had a chance to speak with Frank in the past, and he's a deep thinker, finance oriented, policy oriented. And Frank, normally with three blood, we only unmute alumni speakers because we're careful about Zoom bombing. So I want to promise not to zoom bomb, but then go ahead and uh, offer your question or comment to Brock. So Frank, yeah, welcome. Hi, hi Brock, uh, from the Netherlands, Amsterdam. Uh, please let us know when you come to uh, the Netherlands one day. Um, actually, I have, uh, I mean, there's a lot of money floating uh, through our channels in crypto space and in investment startups and all of that. And we see really huge, to 200 uh, billion. And you see also that there is a little bit of a privatization of democracy. That's on one side. Uh, and on the other side, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, big companies and uh, when you talk about investments that you're gonna make, up to what extent are human rights part of or should be part of uh, the decision-making process, particularly also when it reflects on working in areas where human rights are not uh, followed up on. I mean, you talked about uh, TikTok, uh, coming from China. So it would be great if you could elaborate a little bit on that one. Um, I, I, I have a, a Peter Terre. I have a house in Amsterdam um, that uh, was reported on uh, because I bought it with, uh, with crypto using a, I, I, I borrowed, I used crypto as collateral to secure essentially the loan to buy the, uh, uh, the property. And so uh, uh, I, I, I keep a house in Amsterdam, so I, I hope to be there soon enough. In terms of human rights, I think it's, uh, it's very important that we stand up for, uh, you know, stand up when we see inequality or injustice in the world. You know, it just, it just is. And I think that it's important in this day and age, and we're seeing it here in the U.S., with George Floyd and other things. And it's the onus is on us to like make a real change. And so uh, I, am, I am for doing whatever we can to create a more just world. And to, and to, make, sure that, and to make sure that things are balanced. And, uh, and what is the role that crypto or does technology play in this? Um, it, it uh, well, it's a system of transparency, right? We're, we're here to, to shed light into, you know, dark corners and hopefully expose those things that are not serving us collectively. I'm uh, walking around my new, my new house for the first time. This is, it's, it's an old school, so it's chalkboards <laughs> everywhere in this room. You know, it's Perfect, a little like small, office. to be honest. It looks, it looks amazing. And up to what extent do you think that 
blockchain can help us in creating a more trustworthy internet then when it comes to well, I, and accountability i mean it should be able to um uh well i mean to, you know censorship resistance is a very real issue i don't know if you saw uh donald trump's new executive order lawsuits by tulsi gabbard against google you know mm -hmm. i guess google is censoring political candidates uh and not just donald trump and they're taking the position it appears from what i read that uh they are allowed to do that uh and they're allowed to influence political outcomes and that they don't believe they've got any obligations to to to, to support free speech that they are not uh, subject to uh, uh abiding by the concept of free speech so really interesting stuff that we're seeing right now clearly um preventing censorship uh is one of those things that this technology could enable in a in a positive way yep as someone who had one of his accounts nuked by facebook i can't wait uh thank you frank appreciate it so next we're going to bring on another one of our esteemed alumni speakers it's professor wolf call um I've, I've had the pleasure of recently starting to work with this call on an interesting DAO related project and he's a very sharp analytical thinker so welcome and i'm gonna hand the mic to you uh, thank you gordon for your kind words uh, brock nice to meet you um over this medium um i know you're busy with um, with uh, other things right now but um i'm wondering i mean you, you've been an important figurehead in the in the community um, your campaign, I believe, raises awareness and helps uh, mainstream adoption in the digital asset space. But I'm wondering if you could take a few moments and talk about um, sort of a crypto anarchist perspective on politics. So a lot of folks who've been founding members of the community, uh, they are wild. somewhat disillusioned with the existing system and politics and the, uh, if you want, uh, corruptive elements, some, some would argue that politics are exposed to uh, consistently. And so this notion of politics is broken and uh, crypto is an alternative, I think it's probably been pretty strong in the community. Um, and you said legitimately that uh, crypto is not ready for prime time. Can you help us understand a little bit how your campaign sort of squares with these early, early beginnings and um, what, what it can mean for the, for the digital asset community in the long run? Well, I, I mean, I think that what we have here is we're building a parallel system. And that parallel system, for the most part, is independent from, call it, the traditional legacy system. But those two things coexist. And, and to some degree, they exist potentially in conflict. And I think it's very important that we find a way for the new and the old to, to, to exist harmoniously and come together in a win-win, again, all-win sort of scenario. I, am, uh, I pray that we don't find ourselves in a revolutionary event. You know, revolutions are typically chaotic and violent. I'm, I pray that we find an evolutionary uh, path forward. And so I live between the old and the new world. I attempt to be a bridge between both of those systems as we find ourselves in a new world built with new tools that deliver greater equality, justice, and all the things that we care about principally, you know, from the, call it the crypto anarchistic sort of perspective. But the reality is we still live in this legacy system. And so how do we find balance? How do we build bridges between the old world and the new? Yep. Oh, yeah. Are you guys satisfied with that answer? Well, my, my concern is that arguably, once you dip back into it, you're bringing all the baggage back, back, back with you, right? And it actually is, is harder to create lasting solutions in new systems if you are burdened by the legacy systems, right? So how do you walk that line? And I don't have the answer. I'm just interested in your views on this. Uh, Brock, you're muted. 
Yeah. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. I don't have the power to unmute. Um, well, it depends on what your, your role in this is. I've chosen to live between both worlds and attempt to bridge those systems. But that's not everybody's responsibility, right? We, have, we all have different roles to play. You know, some people are just going to be participants in the development of the new system. Some people are going to hold on to legacy systems until the very end, right? And we all have different roles to play and, and that's okay, everyone in their time. I've chosen, you know, to be someone that sits between both worlds. And that's because I have a lot of those relationships, right? I've been educating the legacy world for a very long time about the importance of this technology because at first they were fearful of it, right? They, and Which is human nature to fear that which you don't understand. But how do you conquer fear? You conquer fear with knowledge. And so I've spent a big part of the time in this industry educating the legacy world that no, this technology has real benefits and it's making the world a better place. And, you know, and, and so this is a role that I've played and I'm only through this process attempting to play it more so ultimately if successful as a head of state to help facilitate a peaceful evolutionary event that creates a better world for all of us. Interesting. Uh, Luke, can, can we bring on, thank you, Professor. I always like to say Professor. Uh, Luke, can you bring on Marco? Um, Marco, I think has, he, want, he wants his other camera enabled if you can. Let's see what we can do here. Uh, Marco is also an alumni speaker, also involved uh, with the DevDAO project. Marco, welcome. You're, you're in the Cayman Islands? I always, I always gotta get this straight. And you're muted or we can't hear you. Is that better? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, Hi, Marco. Uh, Are you in the Caymans? <laughs> I am in the Caymans. And uh, I love Brock's walking around <laughs> doing his thing. <laughs> so I thought I'd just do the same. <laughs> Um, anyway, on to uh, the, the question of the, the transition, and Wolf brought this up, of course, is that, you know, uh, you have two ways of attacking uh, change in the world. One is to uh, work within the system to improve it uh, incrementally over time, and the other is to build a parallel system and hope everyone moves over to it, uh, which is pretty much the way the uh, crypto slash blockchain world is moving. Um, you in my opinion, you can't escape legacy until you've destroyed it. So you're always going to have to have some kind of a bridge going on. And kudos to you, Brock, for actually being part of that bridge. Um, I'm specifically uh, interested in your perceptions on self-sovereign decentralized identity and how that, in my perspective, I see it as being the way you bridge everybody eventually into this world is by providing them a self-controlled, self-managed and accountable uh, way of interacting with the digital space that is, once it's simplified, then the complexities of crypto become less so because you've now packaged all that up into your identity. And you now just interact with your identity and now you can move on to, you know, at, at that point, adding a wallet to your identity is a simple thing because you just, the ba everything happens in the background. You don't see all the, all the addresses and the uh, keys passing in and, sh and changing hands. Uh, what is your thought on that, Brock? Yeah, so um, I'm a big believer in self-sovereignty, right? I believe that uh, the future is about real sovereignty, liberty, freedom, right? Um, and so, a uh, big, big believer in supporting that idea, you know, teaching people what it is to be sovereign. I, I go through a pretty regular, what's called sovereignty prayer, um, which uh, I, I can <laughs> recite to you at some, uh, uh, some later time, but uh, digital identity, I do believe is the holy grail of uh, tool sets or, or, or that system that will ultimately enable, you know, kind of the floodgates opening. Uh, you know, obviously 
how the blockchain has solved for double spend issues is enabled a lot of the stuff that we do today, but to really allow this, you know, this digital world uh, to really take off and take root, we have to solve identity uh, within the world that we live in with, because of all the legacy systems, the legacy systems, um, you know, the main thing the legacy system has going for it is that identity, the only system of identity lives in that world. And until we've created a digital identity solution that's part of our parallel system, we are always going to have a difficult time operating at scale, operating within the, call it regulated legacy world. And so uh, really excited to see all of the attempts at solving that problem. I believe that we're almost there. Um, obviously, uh, EOS is trying to solve that through voice. Vinny Lingham is trying to solve that with Civic. Uh, my, uh, uh, my friend Craig Sellers and team are trying to solve this problem. There's a bunch of people there. I think that we'll have solved the digital identity problem, or excuse me, we'll have uh, solved for that opportunity. Uh, I would think by probably next year we'll be you know, past a, a, a prototype and something that's starting to function and work. And uh, I'm, as always, I'm agnostic to wherever the solution comes from. I've always been a believer that uh, if anyone makes the world a better place, we all win. So I support innovation uh, coming from, you know, anyone and everyone willing to do it. And uh, I think that, you know, it's important that we learn from each other. You know, we're ultimately, again, all in this together. And Marco, Welcome. share 30 seconds about yourself and why this is a theme every single time we talk. So it's obviously something you're passionate <laughs> about. Just 30 seconds, you and why you're into this. Uh, well, I've been in the blockchain space for about five years now and running a development company that builds solutions for third parties and also a few little private projects for three. Um, and uh, Brock and I, you and I have met a couple of times over the past year, just in bumping into each other. Um, and uh, one of our little pet projects is a digital identity solution. Um, we've looked at everything that's out there so far, and we have a few ideological issues with all of them. Uh, some of them because they require money, and we don't think identity should. And uh, others because uh, they're not as decentralized as they say they are. Well, uh, so uh, we've been so driving I, down I, that I, pathway. So, uh, uh, I, yes, let's make it free and let's make it decentralized. So really glad to hear that that's going well for you. And I would love to, would love to learn more and uh, understand how I can be supportive. Though there's not that much I can do during this next 98 days. Um, <laughs> president is a very full-time job. It starts very early every day, and it uh, and it goes very late. And uh, it's it's seven days a week. <laughs> well, I, I'm not expecting you to get lots of votes, but I'm actually hoping that you make enough to make it interesting for people. Well, so let me let me tell you um, uh, our strategy because I think you might find this interesting. Um, I've been talking to all the sort of political advisors and political, you know, strategists. And, and when I explain our strategy, they, their, their jaws drop pretty much every time. And they're like, who are you? How did you figure <laughs> this out? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm kind of that guy. I'm a, I look at systems a little bit differently than your average person. And so here's what I've explained to them. I said, first of all, you do understand that you don't have to win the election to become president. And they're like, huh? What do you mean? I go, come on, do you, have you read the Constitution? <laughs> do you understand the 12th Amendment? Yeah. And so, uh, so that, that is the fundamental premise that most people don't understand because their knowledge is that every time we've had a president, at least for a while, they've won the general election. And so the the way it works in the US is the general election is about the electoral college vote. And so to win in the general election, you need to win a majority, keyword being majority of the electoral college vote. What happens if there was a tie? 
So there's 530 electoral college votes. If there was a tie, it would be 269 to 269. You need 270 or a majority to win. That's what happened in the year 1800. Thomas Jefferson tied in the election against Aaron Burr. Now, another scenario, what if there was a third party or a fourth party? And what if that third party was to win one state? If a third party was to win one state in a close race, depending upon the state especially, it's possible that no one would get to a majority. What if that third party were to win three states? This is our strategy. If we, were, if we win three states, it is likely that no one will win a majority of the electoral, electoral college vote. And so we are not trying to win the election. We are trying to win just enough to ensure that no one wins in the general election. So then the next question is, and this is by the way, what happened in 1824, you had four candidates. And so no one was able to get a majority of the electoral college vote. So what happens when no one wins in the general election? The top three candidates are then handed over to the House of Representatives and the House of Representatives chooses the president. Historically, they've always chosen the third place candidate to be president. And so we think it's possible that the third place candidate in this election, if the scenario I just stated were to play out, that they would choose the compromise candidate that is focused on uniting a divided nation and that is not from one of the polarized uh, uh, sides of the political spectrum. And so that is our objective in this election. And we are, this is a five year process or more. Uh, this is also laying the groundwork for 2024. I like it. Um, we, have, we have another alumni speaker, uh, Anna Milke Birkis. Um, I think also calling in from the Netherlands. Yes, or correct yes. me if I'm wrong. That's right. Hi, Gordon. Okay, Thanks for quitting. Show. Hi. Thanks for putting me on. Hi, Brock. Now we all know that politics starts with a P. It's a lot about plans, promises, prophecies, and promises. You're the first one that's a real advocate for the blockchain industry, which is my passion. That's also a P. Passion again. Now let's put ourselves a little bit ahead in time. Let's say that you really could decide what the next move was. It's not about plans. Is that first day when you sit behind that desk, what are you going to decide as a first step? That's not a plan, that's not a prophecy, that's not a promise, but that's an actual act that's gonna create something new in what I think is a hopelessly divided situation right now. Um, I, I, I had a hard time hearing you there for a moment. Um, uh, Gordon, can you just repeat the question real quick? I, uh, I think she cut out for a moment, but I think she said, you know, brass tacks, you're sitting in the Oval Office, you're at the, the curse desk, whatever it's called. What is your first significant action? Well, I mean, the, the, the first thing to use uh, a, a P is I'm going to pray. <laughs> <laughs> Good start, but that's actually you get the coffee to survive the first day, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's just to start out and to pray that I, you know, I do that which is in the best interest of everyone. Obviously, it's an incredible responsibility being in that office as, again, President of the United States. And so I pray to, to be guided to do and to make the best decisions possible for you know, call it the collective. And so uh, the next sort of first things and, uh, you know, are, are, are getting to the, the stuff that is really kind of, I think, where the debates are already over. Um, there's a number of things that we need to kind of do immediately. And so I'll be publishing, um, uh, well, the, the platform is something that you're invited to participate in now if you're an American or a U.S. green card holder, um, and that is, uh, and that it, wherever you live, uh, our process to use another P is we're going to be taking our platform and our policies and putting them into a collaborative platform where people will have the ability to edit, comment, and discuss. So this is an invitation to those people that may 
participate to actually co-create and to collaborate in creating this presidential platform. And that's something that no one has ever done before. This is not just my ideas. It's like, how can we collaboratively work on these things, crowdsource much in the same way we do in our industry via GitHub, obviously doing this with a much more user-friendly uh, 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 environment that is easier for everybody. And then through that 100-day plan, you know, what are the things that we hope to do uh, one after another? I do uh, uh, agree with Bernie Sanders, um, you know, position, which is that the conversation around cannabis, whether you use it as a medicine, whether you use it for spiritual reasons or even recreational reasons, I think that debate is already over. Um, and well, that I'm, we need from, to... I'm from the Netherlands, Brox, and you've been to Amsterdam, so that's yes. a bit long over for us. So I, I the debate was I, over in the fifties in Amsterdam. Yeah, Ber Bernie Sanders said that that's what he would do on his first day, and so um, I agree with his position on that. I think the debate is over. Um, cannabis should be legalized immediately. There you go. I, I like it. it Full stop, right? Um, Brock, I, I think we're coming up on the two hours and, and you can tell by, you know, I, I started off in the dark and now I'm surrounded by this heavenly glow, not just from Marina, but just from the sun as well. I, I want to thank you for, you were really generous with your time, your thoughts, your experiences. You're very real, which I think we all appreciate. Um, Sandra, I, I love doing these shows with you and I'm going to you know, pass this back to you and just say, you know, take it away. Yeah, thanks land, for the, land the plane. <laughs> thanks for that, Gordon. Well, I, I think today's show, this week's show, has been really well. Uh, if you look at the, the participants from all over the world, people from Asia logging in, from Europe logging in, uh, from our hometown, Amsterdam in the Netherlands logging in, and also from the US market. So we're really proud and, and grateful for everybody that's, that's listening and for all those people that are watching the recording. Thanks for that. Join us again next week. So before we close up and thank our dear guest, Mr. Brick, uh, Brock Pierce, I would also like to thank our friends who joined us during the call. So that was Professor Wolf Kao, that was Luke Stokes, that was Marco Anibali, and then also from the Netherlands, it was nice to see Annemieke also joining the conversation and addressing all the questions. And of course, our co-partner Frank van Dalen, who was one of the founders in Iconic, where I'm currently at, at Amsterdam, at Beursplein 5. So I would like to say, Gordon, I think this was a nice show this week. Thank you for partnering up. It was good to see Marina also in the cold. Hi, Marina. You have a nice sunshine there in LA. And most importantly also, besides everybody that's watching and joining the call, I would uh, show my appreciation to Brock. I would like to say thank you for being on the show. You've been an industry friend for a couple of years already. We appreciate what you do for the industry. We appreciate what you do, uh, what you give back to the industry. We would, we have love to have you on the show. You're always welcome as a guest. We wish you all the best during the upcoming weeks and months to go by running for president. If there's anything we can do to support you, we are there for you as industry friends. So for now, for everybody, for Brock, Gordon and myself, we would like to wish you a good day wherever you are in the world. We see you again next week on Crypto Wednesday. And thanks again. I look forward to seeing you all next week so thank you for now see you later guys have a good day bye everybody thanks Brian. thank thanks, you everyone. thank you thanks bye everyone